You're listening to The Law Lads Project. I'm your host, Angie Vishianan. I'm a lawyer that launched a startup focused on changing the legal profession through mentorship. Through this podcast, we will explore the early career steps of real lawyers to help students see that many of us didn't have it all figured out at first. It takes time to find your way in the profession, so we want to shed light on some of the challenges people face in the earliest part of building their careers. Each week, I sit down with members of the legal profession and chat with them about the paths they took to get where they are now, including the times they stumbled, the times they fell, and the times they needed a little help. To encourage candor and vulnerability on this show, the attorney guests will remain nameless, but their stories will be laid bare for your consideration. This episode is sponsored by Velocity LSAT. Are you tired of not being an LSAT Kung Fu master? You want to learn how to defeat the LSAT once and for all? Good news! Velocity LSAT has you covered with our world-conquering prep course that will show you how to punch the LSAT right in its dumb face. Velocity is the online video course taught by me, Dave Hall, the guy with all the 180s. At Velocity, we guarantee you'll hit the 99th percentile or improve by at least 10 points or we'll keep working with you until you do. Law Lives listeners that is alliterative, can get half off your first month's installment or $100 off a year's subscription. Just enter code LAWLIVES, L-A-W-L-I-V-E-S, all one word at checkout. Enroll, get more details, and contact info at VelocityLSAT.com. In today's episode, I'll be sitting down with an employment law attorney who's been practicing for over 20 years at some of the largest law firms in America. We'll be discussing her career path from law school to practicing corporate litigation to her transition into employment law. Let's dive right in. What were some of the reasons that you decided to go to law school? I never grew up wanting to be a lawyer. I did not have aspirations of being a lawyer. I was not in a pre-law program. I was a broadcast communications major, and it really wasn't until the middle of my senior year, a couple of months before I was about to graduate, that I realized I hadn't really picked a good career path Mm -hmm. for me that broadcast communications was going to involve a lot more travel, short-term jobs, um, and moving around. And and I had married by that time, and my husband would not, I I would not ask him to live that lifestyle. It was not (laughs) what what either of us wanted. Um, We had roots uh, where we lived, and we we wanted to stay there. I really was searching for other things to do. I just had the idea of maybe going to law school and was encouraged by someone just to take the next step. And so I took the LSAT and I did well enough, I felt, to apply. So I applied and, you know, I got accepted. So I went. That's really how it happened. How did you decide which law school to attend? Uh, I I attended the one that accepted me. (laughs) (laughs) I I only applied to two. uh, For one, I was waitlisted, and the other had accepted me, and I decided to go ahead and get started and just, you know, made my goal to do well enough academically that I could transfer back to the the one where I was waitlisted, and and that's what I did. But how did you decide which ones to even apply to? You know, I I just knew that I wanted to stay in in state. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I knew there was one that I likely wouldn't get into, and there were two others that were possibilities, so I applied to those two. What were a few things that you wish you knew before going to law school? I, I think I had a good understanding of what to expect. And this sounds so corny, but I had read the book 1L mm-hmm. by Scott Turo. Someone had suggested to me, if you're even considering it, read this book. Mm-hmm. And other than the competitiveness, I, I found it to be really accurate. You know, it was 12, 13, 14 hour days. It was tons of reading. It I don't want to say I found it more time-consuming because I felt I had a good understanding of how time-consuming it would be. Mm -hmm. But I could see that that might be what someone else might discover. It is very time-consuming, and there's a lot of reading assigned. But was there anything that surprised you about practicing that you wish you might have known before Mm. going to law school, not just about the law school process? Yeah, no, I, I think that there are areas of the law that are easier to either make money or go further at your firm just because you're able to charge higher rates, mm-hmm. that, that there are some areas of the law that are more rate and price sensitive than others. Um, uh, employment law, what, what I practice, is one of those that is 
more sensitive to Mm -hmm. rate pressure. And therefore, at some big firms, what I do is considered to be almost a commodity. Mm -hmm. And over time, a lot of the big firms even um, got away from employment law Mm -hmm. or they kept carrying the sections of employment law got smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, conceivably there were none in certain states and, Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know. I saw the section that I initially joined out of law school go from 35 lawyers down to two in the time that I was there. If you could have picked a different law school, would you have and why? No, ideally the the law school where I ended up attending is is within the town where I live. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to live in that city Mm -hmm. and I knew that being a graduate of that law school in that city provided opportunities that being a graduate of a law school from another, you know, location or state would not. So for me, it was just really wanting to set myself up as good as possible to get a job um, Mm -hmm. because I had taken out considerable loans um, to go to law school. And so I just, I I knew I wanted to be in in this particular city and I thought that. And did you think your law school helped you get a job? Did they did yes. they prepare you well? Yes. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I got my job through on-campus recruiting okay. and, um, you know, that process. Um, did you participate in any extracurricular activities while you were in law school that were very valuable for your career? I did. I, I, I chose to go the moot court mock trial route, and, and I did both of those. Uh, my first and, and second year, um, you know, including it being on the school team that, that would travel and, and compete, um, and then, you know, taking trial advocacy classes and then also doing the moot court competitions. Do you remember which moot court competitions you were in? That was the Jackson Walker moot court. Okay. I think it still is Jackson Walker moot court. Okay. And what jobs, internships, or activities did you do between your summer from 1L year to 2L year? 1L to 2 oh, I did uh, two clerkships with uh, two law firms. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and what size of the firms? Large firms. Large firms. Yeah, I was focused. I, I, for some reason, I knew that, that I wanted to work at a large firm. Okay. Yeah. And how did you go about getting those positions? Through, through on-campus recruiting. Mm-hmm. Okay. On-campus interviews, callbacks, and then offers. Okay. And what jobs or internships or activities did you do between 2L and 3L? I worked... As a, I don't even know what you would call me. I, I worked for my mother-in-law's, the company where she worked, and I just did filing and busy work. And you didn't go back to the all. firms that you were at. No, they don't, they don't, they didn't offer. Oh. Um, you know what? Actually, I take that back. <laughs> it was reverse. Oh, okay, okay. I think it was one L, and then you interviewed for your two L. Yes, yes. That's what it was reversed. Okay. So. One L, one L. After one L, I I worked for my mother-in-law. After two L, I did my clerkship. Got it. Okay. Did the clerkship actually lead to the offer for your first Correct. job? Correct, it did. Okay, yes. And did you get that offer right after you finished the clerkship, or was it during while you were in school? Uh, it was while I was in my third year okay. I received the offer. Were there any other experiences or connections or other factors that helped you obtain the skills or inroads for your first postgraduate position? I don't see that there was anything unique that I did or different that I did that helped me. Other than get good grades, right? <laughs> yes. get, get good grades. Grades are important, right? For sure. I, I, I think I did well in interviews. I kind of went above and beyond in my clerkship. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, and I suspect a lot of people did, but you know, I would work on things for many, many, many hours, mm-hmm. and you know, late into the night and on the weekends. And I, even though they said don't do that, I did that because I wanted to make sure that. Again, I got a job so I could pay off my loans. Yes. (laughs) Yes, loans are sizable. They are. Um, Law school is expensive these days so and has been historically for some time. Can you generally describe the actual substance of the practice area that you're in? What all does that really involve? Really, it involves anything that affects the relationship between employers and employees. Mm -hmm. So traditional labor for employers who have unions, negotiating those agreements, handling grievances that arise under those agreements, to the non-union setting, advising employers on termination decisions, hiring decisions, policy decisions, reviewing policies and handbooks and making recommendations. I do training 
um, you know, harassment training, management training, leadership training for employees, you know, for workforces, and sometimes for executives as well. Um, and then on the litigation side, it's just really anything. It, it, it's the whole gamut of any type of lawsuit that an employee could bring mm -hmm. against uh, their employer. Um, usually it's following termination or a failure to promote or, you know, a sexual harassment situation. Those, those are the typical and scenarios. How did you, and how did you choose that practice area? I didn't. Yeah, that, okay. yeah, that practice area chose me. <laughs> <laughs> I, coming out of law school, I just was somewhat of a free floater, I think as it might sound from a story. <laughs> I didn't know I wanted to go to law school. When I got in law school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I made a decision probably in my first year of law school that I knew it wasn't transactional. Okay. I didn't, I didn't enjoy contracts as much as I enjoyed torts and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And, and, and I really enjoyed the, the on your feet advocacy of the mock trials and the new courts. So I, I knew, and coming from a broadcast communications major, I mean, that's mm -hmm. what my undergrad was. I, I wanted to be a talker. Mm -hmm. And so I had that down and then, then, it, so then, and I like sports. This is literally how it got there. So I like sports. <laughs> so my second year, one of the classes that I took was a sports law class because I thought that would be fun. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being a lot of antitrust um, because they went into you know, the whole exemption from antitrust law. But anyway, I, and then I fell in love with antitrust. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know what antitrust was when I took that <laughs> class. But I really liked antitrust. So my third year, I took antitrust. And I came out of law school wanting to practice antitrust litigation. And the firm where I ended up working did a lot of that. So for my first two years, I did um, corporate litigation, antitrust, patent, securities. And then how I got to my current field was I went on maternity leave and I came back. And in the interim, they had decided they wanted um, to bring on two more associates to the labor and employment section. And, and rather than hire laterally um, or hire, they asked to several of the litigation associates if they would be interested in moving sections. And uh -huh. they sold it to me that I would get more hands-on experience earlier. I'd be doing depositions and hearings because the case is tend to be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, where I, What I was doing, I was the sixth attorney on a case, and I would be the second or maybe third. And that was appealing to me. So, so I around what year were you at? I was the second, second or third. Okay. And do you think that you chose the right practice area? Or that it chose me? Yeah, that it, it chose right you correctly? I, yeah, I do. I mean, I think I would have been happy doing antitrust as well. I enjoy the practice of law. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I like employment, and I've had a lot of fun with it. And I was with such a fantastic group of lawyers uh, at my first firm, and still, but particularly at my first firm, uh, being a baby lawyer, they were great mentors. We had a lot of fun. Employment law cases can be a lot of fun because they're very dramatic, and there's the facts tend to be more like soap operas than <laughs> than what you would imagine. But it was fun, and it is fun. How long have you been in your current role? In my current role as senior attorney, about a year and a half now. Can you describe about five or ten actual discrete tasks that you work on? I think you had mentioned that you work on some agreements, that you also do um, litigation related to the employment matters, that you've reviewed handbooks. and um, Can you just list a few more things? Sure. Um, well, you know, litigation runs the gamut of, you know, conducting discovery, taking depositions, drafting. I do a lot of practice in federal court, so a, a strong motion practice, mm -hmm. um, good drafting skills, good researching skills. Research is still one of the things I love to do. Um, I can't do it. I can't bill for it as much as I used to, <laughs> but I still do it. Um, uh, client interviews, investigations. Um, I love doing uh, invest, you know, internal investigations when mm -hmm. someone has complained and they need an outside lawyer to handle it. Can you describe some of the like non-billable things that are part of your job? Um, oh, <laughs> time, time entry. Yes. Um, I hate time entry. Uh, Who doesn't? I, that, that's, it's the only thing that would force me to leave w what I'm currently doing and go in-house is just to not 
or even to go to the plaintiff side, just to One not of these days, have to firms worry will about figure it. it out how not to do billable hours. I, I wish, yeah, I wish there was some way that it's like, can't you just pay me monthly and then I just do what <laughs> I do, or just pay me by the case, or mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. There, uh, we need to come up. But but that's that's my big number one. Um, you know, just reports. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of our clients, being as large as they all, you know, they need reports of you know who is working on what, um, how much time are they billing, how much time do you predict, you know, will be billed, forecasts, budgets, things of that nature. I I do a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Meetings. We have a lot of meetings. You know, business meetings planning meetings, strategy meetings. Um, those are more fun, but I, I don't particularly like any of the administrative work. <laughs> what types of clients do you mostly work with, like large mm-hmm. corporations? Or? Yeah, most of my clients are large, um, either 14500 or 14100 or even 1450 companies, large companies that have uh, internal legal departments mm-hmm. where I am working with other lawyers. Um, I also have, you know, a few smaller companies, Mm -hmm. um, less employees, less ongoing issues. And there I'll I'll deal with like a principal, either a a president, sometimes a CFO, you know, it it just, it varies. However, their company is structured, but I'll be dealing more with an executive level business person as opposed to another lawyer. And how much of your time do you think you spend interacting with clients? I'd say probably 20 to 25% of my time um, is is actually spent interacting with with the client or or with their employees Mm -hmm. on some aspect of the case. How much of your time do you spend in either court or other administrative proceedings or mediation Mm -hmm. or arbitration? Yeah, I don't, we don't spend much time in court these days. You know, I've been practicing for, you know, like I said, 21 years and I've had four trials and Mm -hmm. Four or five arbitrations. Well, probably more arbitrations than that account, the labor side. But <laughs> not not very many opportunities because not very many cases actually go to trial. Right. Our goal is to try get them dismissed or settled before trial. It, it, it's almost, I almost view it as a failure if I have a case that has to go to trial um, because it's obviously going to be more costly and risky for my client. Yeah, <laughs> so not much. You know, uh, state, we're having more and more cases filed in state court helps because you do actually have a hearing on everything. So um, if I had to put a percentage to it, I would probably say 20% of my time is actually spent in a tribunal, whether mm-hmm. that be a court or, you know, a, an arbitration or a mediation. And is that, like I said, is that mostly state court, federal court, or in arbitration and mediation? Yeah, more so, um, probably the most of my time is would be spent in arbitrations and mediations. Um, well, overall, the most of my time spent is just on discovery and motion practice. I would say probably 50% of my time mm-hmm. is, um, I don't draft discovery anymore, but I right. review it and I yeah. follow up on it and I conduct a lot of depositions and I engage in a lot of mediations. Mm-hmm. And then do you do any transactional work? The only transactional thing that, that I do would be reviewing policies mm-hmm. and handbooks and uh, drafting or reviewing contracts, whether okay. they're you know, executive comp agreements or severance agreements or settlement agreements. So what are the five best things about your job? For me, where I am right now, I would say the I, the flexibility for me. I, I do have flexibility, and it wasn't always that way. As a younger attorney, you have to understand you're not going to have that. Right. And, and I think that's one of the big issues with law students coming out um, of law school today, especially if they haven't worked, if they haven't had a job before. You know, I was expected to be in the office pretty much every day. You know, working from home wasn't an option when I was a baby lawyer. Now that I've been, you know, doing it for two decades, I have a little bit more confidence from my peers that if I need to work at home or if I need to leave early or if I just, I'm going to work on Saturday or I have work to do, but I'm going to do it Saturday because Friday's homecoming and I want to be there to do all of that. That's fine. I, I, you know, I don't get really questioned about that. And, um, And even just scheduling depositions, scheduling hearings, scheduling arbitrations. I have control in when those dates are selected. And so I know on this particular night, you know, I have a board meeting or on this particular you know, day, I'm taking my mom to the doctor. 
So I can say to an opposing counsel, yeah, no, that day won't work for me. So and, flexibility mm-hmm. and control over your own schedule. And control over your schedule. That's, okay. oh, that's two. <laughs> um, it's, it's intellectually stimulating. Uh-huh. Every case is, is different. And so you are constantly being challenged. Yesterday, I was in a mediation, and we were researching an issue that neither I nor the other lawyer who was with me had ever we just had we knew it was out there, but we had just never actually had it come up in any of our cases. And we were both on our computers researching this little legal issue that you know um, we just had never come across before. Mm-hmm. So intellectual stimulation is good. Um, I like the collegiality of a large firm. I've always been reluctant to look at even in house. And I guess if you went and, and worked for a legal department at a big company where you're interacting with a lot of business people, that might be okay. But I, I was just always concerned about working with only you know, four or five people mm-hmm. um, uh, for me. Um, like having that team mm-hmm. behind you. <laughs> yeah. And then the pay. The pay is great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the pay and, pay and the benefits are great. You're listening to The Law Lives Project with Angie Vishianen. This episode is sponsored by The Law School Toolbox. Are you in law school or hoping to attend? Check out The Law School Toolbox. The Law School Toolbox was created in 2012 by Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess to help demystify law school and the early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. On the website, lawschooltoolbox.com, you can find tons of free resources for law students, including the popular Law School Toolbox podcast and blog. You'll also find options for private tutoring and online courses, like the Start Law School Right course, to make sure that you're ready to go on day one. For all of your law school needs, the Law School Toolbox is here to help. Check it out today at lawschooltoolbox.com. Now, back to the episode. Now, what are the five worst things about your job? <laughs> Timekeeping, timekeeping, timekeeping. Timekeeping time is definitely at the top of my list, and 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 really the other reports, you know, that I'm required to do anything that takes me away from actual billing work. Not because I I feel I must bill, but because that's the type of work that I like to do. And what's your smallest billing unit? Uh, point one. Tenth Right, a tent. So, I mean, even just to put it in perspective, I, I, I do a good amount of counseling and talking to clients on the phone and, and some who we even, you know, we'll, we even text or, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk over cell phones on the drive home. Um, and, and I don't ever bill for any right. of that. It's not even worth my time to right. sit down. It takes <laughs> more time to that enter it. <laughs> right. Then we... And and I think they I think they appreciate it. and I tell yeah. them that I'm like yeah. if you call me and if I have to do any research if I have to get someone else involved then yes we're gonna have to bill you but if you just want my you know my my feeling on a situation mm-hmm. or my advice just you know call me mm-hmm. so so just timekeeping <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much um, you know now that we've gone to you know I I used to not like having to wear a suit every day to just sit in my office. Mm-hmm. As a young attorney, which we we did have to do, but that's you know gone away with the business casual now. Do you have um, a billable hour requirement with uh, I don't. a senior counsel? Okay. No, I mean I have an expectation, um, and I have certain benchmarks that if I achieve, I make more money. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not you know a hard fast. It's it's a goal. You know, and I strive to get it, but I don't always get there. Can you say what the expectation is? Sure, it, it's eighteen hundred. Okay, mm-hmm. and then what's the structure for the bonus? Or it's just it... to hit the eighteen hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It's not if, a... if I hit eighteen hundred, I, I get a okay, nice so healthy not bonus. A discretionary. No, okay. no, no. What are a few things that you wish you knew about your practice area or industry when you first started working in it? Yeah, I think just uh, I wish I would have known how competitive it was going to get with (laughs) with all of the employment law boutiques. Mm -hmm. I I have seen that firsthand over the last, you know, 20 years. Just um, they start squeezing out this type of work from the large firm practice. Mm -hmm. Um, And even when when there is the practice at the larger firms, you kind of you're kind of seen as more of a niche, more of a commodity. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's corporate. 
that drives it, litigation that drives it, financial restructuring, mm -hmm. real estate. And then you kind of have, well, even patent, but then I would say environmental mm -hmm. and employment are, are kind of the two that stick out as just being more commodity-like mm -hmm. and more rate-sensitive. Okay. So we do the same amount of work for less money, <laughs> basically. Yes. Yeah. What are some things that other lawyers don't even know about your practice area? How crazy it can be. <laughs> it, it, you know, if we don't have a conversation, I, I deal with a lot of pro se mm -hmm. uh, plaintiffs in this area. So unrepresented individuals, um, some of which I, I think are certifiable, um, <laughs> you know, but yet you have to deal with them mm -hmm. and, it's harder, in my opinion, to work on those cases because they don't know what they're doing. They'll throw out all kinds of allegations <laughs> that you have to then refute or, you know, oppose on a legal ground that don't even matter at all, but you still have to address them. Whereas if that person was represented by someone, they might have even told them you don't have a case or if you have a case, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so probably that. Um, just some of the crazy, crazy emails that I get, crazy <laughs> calls that I get. Mm -hmm. Around uh, how many hours do you typically work a week, um, billable and non-billable? Yeah, uh, probably about, th I'm probably 35 or 40 billable. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So this year I'm probably billing 25 and, you know, mm -hmm. hours a week and putting in 25 non-billable, mm -hmm. it seems, a, a week. But I would say on average, when, when I'm less um, involved in bar activities, I would say 35 is a good billable and, you know, 10 non-billable a week. Okay. And this is completely optional if you want to answer or not. Um, some people are sensitive to it and some people are not. Sure. Um, what is the earning potential of someone in your position? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem. In, in my position where I am at my level at a large firm, I would say the earning potential is probably between two hundred and fifty thousand and four hundred thousand. Okay. There are persons in you know in similar positions that I know make more mm -hmm. than four hundred thousand, um, but they're they're rare. Mm -hmm. They're they're rare. Is I, it usually because they're bringing in more business. Or yeah, they yeah. usually have strong connections with very large clients with very large books of business. Okay. And what are some of the leading bar associations or professional organizations that um, for your particular practice area or that you participate in? Right, yes. Um, the Dallas Bar Association, I, I'm an active member uh, and uh, director on the board. Um, and then the Dallas Women Lawyers Association, mm -hmm. I've been involved with that organization for about seven years now. Um, and then I do, I'm also on the Dallas Bar Community Involvement Committee. Mm -hmm. Any employment what law else? specific? I'm not. Yeah, okay. I, no, there, no, I'm not. There's not uh, very many. Okay. Uh, Can you I, think of any that you would say is like the flagship? Or no? Well, I think the employment law section of the State Bar or mm -hmm. the American Bar Association mm -hmm. Actually, I am a member of the employment law section of the <laughs> Bar Association, but I'm just not very active right. in it at, at the moment. Um, and also, the, I'm the employment law section of the Dallas Bar mm -hmm. Association, but again, not, not very active on it. All right. Let's switch gears for a moment and go into some advice for law students. Okay. Um, what character traits does someone need to possess to excel in a position like yours? You have to be comfortable speaking. Mm -hmm. to, to do what I do um, doesn't mean you can't be a highly, you know, wildly fantastic, successful lawyer, but mm -hmm. to go into litigation, you, you have to like that arena. Um, you have to like the combative nature of mm -hmm. it, or at least not be put off by it. Mm -hmm. I think personally, you have to kind of enjoy it. <laughs> um, you know, wanting to be one step ahead, wanting to have the upper hand, you know, wanting to win the motion, to win the trial. And and I, I do think you, you have to be comfortable with public speaking, mm -hmm. or at least to a point where you can become comfortable with it, because you will be called upon to speak a lot. <laughs> <laughs> What are some things that law students can do to meet or network with other lawyers in your practice area or industry? I think as a general 
more general rule because you can always find people who do, you know, employment law, right? And there, there really isn't an identifiable, oh, if you want to do employment law, you have to go do this, right? I mean... But if uh, a student wanted to, like, go find a place to talk to an employment lawyer... Yeah, or... yep. what I would do is uh, every, I think it's the, the third Monday, uh, I think it's the third <laughs> Monday of every month, the employment law section of the Dallas Bar Association has a, a CLE or presentation and, and lunch um, at the Belo Mansion mm-hmm. here in Dallas. So if you ever, if there was a law student that just wanted to hang out with employment lawyers, mm-hmm. that's where you would go. Get okay. there early and yeah. be prepared to stay a little late because they, you know, there's not much time for networking right. during the speaker. Does the ABA uh, employment law section also have events or no, not not regularly. Um, there are, you know, retreats and seminars, and there is programming that the Dallas Bar and the Texas Bar do, you know, every year in Texas. So, um, and I believe that they're all open to law students as well. So if someone was inclined to go down to the annual, you know, advanced employment seminar that rotates by city mm-hmm. every year, or when it's in Dallas, if you, you know, someone could go and learn and listen and network, they could do that. But um, I think for a law student, it's probably best to, number one, get to know your classmates because mm-hmm. those are the folks that are more than likely going to be in a position at some point to give you business mm-hmm. um, or to give you a job opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely stay active in your alumni mm-hmm. association and get involved in the bar. And do you have any advice for someone who would want to follow in your career path, going big law, <laughs> employment? Uh, make good grades. <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah, you, it, to get into a big law firm these days, you have to have extremely good grades. So what have been the biggest challenges in your career? Time, you know, finding enough time to, to do it all and, and, you know, to do it all well and to, to the level of my expectations and, the expectations of my boss and my husband and my kids. And, um, just really, you know, that, yeah. str- that struggle that I don't necessarily know is unique to the law. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that there are lots of other careers that are as demanding, you know, on a wife and mother's time. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's a, str- it's a daily struggle. What are some things you do to make that work with fam- struggling with family and mm-hmm. you know, with work obligations? And how, how have you struck the balance. Yeah, I, and I think it's changed over mm-hmm. the years. I, I think when I was a young attorney, we had a nanny that, mm-hmm. that helped. Um, it, it, not with my first child, but when the time that second child came mm-hmm. um, and my young, then my oldest was you know, starting daycare and I needed, you know, I, obviously I couldn't pick him up. I couldn't, you know, get him all the time. <laughs> so ultimately, we, we started off with a full-time nanny um, for my youngest son, who then picked up my older son as well. And eventually, we were able to progress to then a part-time nanny who mm-hmm. just picked both the kids up after school and, you know, would get them to their after-school activities, and then mom and dad would usually meet them there. Mm-hmm. Um, she also helped with, you know, laundry and groceries <laughs> and just all that stuff that mm-hmm. takes time. Um then I think as I got into more of a upper, you know, I would say, tenure attorney. Certainly by the time I was a partner, because I was a partner at a at a different firm, it was more kind of setting the expectations mm-hmm. of of the kind of the law firm in in a sense. You know, not not anything um, overt, but just subtly kind of letting the people that you work with know that. Um, but family time is, is very important. Um, not that it isn't to everyone, but I've never missed a game, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I'm, and I'm proud of that. I'm That's proud. That's amazing. I'm yeah, it's truly amazing. I had two boys that played sports all through high school. One is still playing. They played year round sports, um, to a varying amazing. degree. And I even got to the point where I didn't, when they were younger, I didn't want to miss practice. Mm-hmm. But we at least, you know, once they get older, then they don't want you there. So that made that <laughs> easier. But it's, it's very important. And it's very important to my husband. I mean, it's what we do together. Um, and that's just that's just really important. And I've missed firm retreats mm-hmm. because I wasn't going to miss, you know, the Friday night game. And the lawyers that work closely with me know that. Mm-hmm. They know that that's a hard stop 
for me, unless it is just an extreme client emergency, then of course I would have to do it. But we've always been able to manage around that. You know, we've always been able to work it out. And um, so that that's how I'm managing it now. Mm-hmm. And I firmly believe that once my kids are in college, <laughs> um, I will probably work a lot more, um, <laughs> except then when they're home for mm-hmm. breaks, it will be a hard stop that sure. they're home, you know. Mm-hmm. And can you talk a little bit about your transition from one firm to another? What made you make that decision? Yeah, it was really business related. Um, so the large firm that I started my career with was one of those firms that eventually allowed employment law to somewhat die on the vine. Mm-hmm. They, they did not push anyone out. They didn't fire anybody. But as the drive to raise rates higher and higher, the clients that we were working on just couldn't and wouldn't. There were other options. I mean, they liked us, but there are other options. And, and it, it started becoming so much more of a business. You know, instead of us making proposals and pitches to lawyers, to the legal team, we were making them to, you know, the accountants mm. and the finance people and the people that are doing the budgets. And it just became somewhat of a line item. Mm. And so we felt the first move was going to a firm that um, allowed a lot more flexibility, mm-hmm. but still had a good footprint mm-hmm. to um, service our clients. And then my second move, so I, that that was that was to a, a large uh, regional firm. They only had offices in Texas, okay. about three hundred attorneys, um, but all in Texas. And and our whole group went. Okay. Right. So I went along with a group. Okay. And the next, the, the last move, the most recent move, I went out on my own mm-hmm. um, and I came to another national, large national firm, kind of where mm-hmm. I had started. I, I just felt more comfortable with that type of work, those type of clients. Um, my big client came with me, mm-hmm. um, which provided me, you know, a, a platform mm-hmm. to kind of go out on my own. Mm-hmm. And the plan is to make partner. Yes. Um I, I think they would rather it be sooner. <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to wait until mm-hmm. my kids are, because I sure. just don't know, you know, I want to, if I do it, I, I want to do it well. Yes. Right. And, and at a big, big national firm, like where I am, I would have to sacrifice, I think right now, perhaps more than I'm willing to sacrifice. So mm-hmm. as long as they're okay, <laughs> as long as we're all okay with the agreement. Um, mm-hmm. And now if they really want me to make the push, I'll make the push. Um, but right now I'm, I'm okay. I'm coasting. Last question. Have you faced any particular challenges being a female lawyer? I cannot say that I have, but I know a lot of others mm-hmm. who, who have. Um, I, I don't know if I was just fortunate. I think that had something to do with it. I, I was very lucky. The first firm where I, where I worked was very female-friendly, had several female partners, um, and just had really good role models. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really what attracted me to them. I saw that they were these, you know, very well-respected, powerful female attorneys, you know, one of whom had five children, four still in school. Oh, my goodness. You know, and... Superwoman. <laughs> she was. Now, I will inject this because I always inject this. She had a husband who did not work. Oh. And most of go. the very successful, powerful female lawyers mm-hmm. who I know either either d- decided to not have children or had a, a, a spouse that stayed at home and mm-hmm. filled that role. I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a husband who had his own career, who wanted to stay in his career, who wanted to work. And, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, whose work was the nature of the work was not flexible. Mm-hmm. He had to be in the he has to be in the office. Yeah. Um, and so he, he, it's not like he could take a couple of days off if I needed to go out of town or anything. So, right. I, you know, we have to compare apples to apples in that yes. regard, but at least it was, it was something I felt I could aspire yes. to, right? Yes. It, they don't hold it against her because she's a woman. Right. It's just based on what she is able to do. Right. And I always felt that way. I always felt that I was given fair opportunities. I was in a a salary structure that we were all paid the same. Mm -hmm. Um, There really weren't many discretionary bonuses given at all. It was all lockstep based on hours billed, and that's completely within our control. Can you describe uh, what lockstep means? Sure. Uh, Lockstep is, well, lock, I guess I don't, 
kind of misused it. Well, no, I didn't. So lockstep is essentially where um, attorneys are paid based on their graduation year. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, first year associate, second year, third year, and they are all paid the same base. Um, and then there are usually, at least at the big law firms where I worked and most of them, there, there's then or could be, in, in, you know, added compensation based on the number of hours billed. So this is the minimum you have to bill, you know, say 2,000 hours. But if you hit 2,100, you get X more. If you right. hit 22, you get X more. Okay. But it's everybody knows it is yeah. playing by the same rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. that at least makes it fair. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. All right, well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this today. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Right, everyone that's it for today thank you to our guest speaker and thank you to all of you for listening to another episode of the law lives project if you're a prospective law student that's interested in speaking with attorneys one-on-one -on -one, check out leguplegal.com leguplegal is an online mentoring platform that connects prospective law students with attorney mentors sign up for a membership today to learn more about the practice of law and see if it's a good fit for you if you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate it if you left a review on iTunes or any other platform that you're listening on. If you have any questions or comments about anything you heard on the podcast, or if you have ideas for guest speakers, please contact me by emailing me and my team at info at Thanks again, and don't forget to tune in next week. <laughs>